Well, in the interest of time, I think we're just going to get started here. Uh, hopefully, our second panelist will join us in time to uh, give his half of the important discussion of the on the question of cooperation and competition. Uh, but I think we're just going to get started here. We do have Maria's here and ready to go. So I think we'll just uh, see how, the, how everything goes. And hopefully, uh, Professor uh, Ziang will show uh, soon. And we'll have him go second. But we'll get started. Uh, my name is Will Pomeranz. I'm Deputy Director here at the Kennan Institute. And I'm pleased to welcome you to the Kennan Institute's and Kissinger Institute's uh, second program in our series, China and Russia on Their Own Terms, which examines the intellectual, cultural, and geostrategic traditions of the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China and their global and regional impact. Uh, we look forward to having this series uh, meet on several occasions in the coming year. And we will have, I think, a very interesting and productive discussion on the comparisons and interactions between Russia and China. As I mentioned, today's event is titled uh, Cooperation or Competition, Chinese and Russian Eurasian Projects. Um, we're just going to, as I said, get started with, um, with Maria Snegavaya, who is a PhD student candidate at Columbia University, uh, working on sources of support for the populist parties in Eastern Europe. Uh, however, uh, Maria is also a very prominent and distinguished commentator on developments in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, she publishes a biweekly column in the Russian newspaper Vietnamisti and regular con regularly contributes to U.S. journals, including The Washington Post, The New Republic, and The American Interest. And in that sense, she's putting uh, all graduate students, past and present, to shame uh, for somehow not being able to have a, ma 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 uh, a major commentary job while trying to, f the, to finish a PhD, which is a very unique combination to have. So uh, we'll get started. Uh, Maria, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your interest in this topic. So actually, I was going to actually be the second speaker. So uh, I was going to be a little bit critical about the whole optimism be, uh, uh, between Russia uh, and China collaboration. Although, so it, it's a little bit unusual that I'm going to start with a more critical perspective, and then hopefully the next speaker will leave you all with hopes and uh, lots of um, happy uh, prospects. So um, I was going to present the uh, more or less, what is more or less kind of united perspective of the liberal experts in Russia on what is going on with China right now. First of all, when we're talking about Russian-China collaboration, we're talking about a whole bunch of projects, right? So this BRICS, um, uh, um, in a project that actually aims to unite uh, the emerging markets and that kind of consistently tries to die but then kind of revives and then tries to die again. Uh, another very ambitious project and actually quite uh, promising that has been recently la launched in Russia is the prospect of development of the uh, far further eastern uh, uh, area of uh, Russia, which is traditionally underdeveloped. So uh, right now, uh, the Russian government has been uh, has launched this idea of the new special economic zone for those regions, which will supposedly be like have very low uh, taxes and very convenient. Um, uh, very convenient uh, environment uh, to work there, especially in the Russian case, that means uh, diminishing de uh, diminishing the uh, corruption and bureaucracy associated f with getting certain permissions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that project directly welcomes uh, China. At least at the moment, the current document package uh, looks quite uh, promising. And uh, let's hope if it, wor it, if it works out. But uh, we do remember, though, that in the past, similar projects that try to create those special economic zones in Russia, the most famous probably being Skolkovo project, didn't really succeed either because they uh, contradict to the um, uh, political realities of Russia that are based on, f on unfortunate briberies and corruption and redistribution of, s of the profits to the uh, uh, bureaucrats. Uh, however, that is promising. Uh, and now we also have, among other, multiple other infrastructural projects with China. Uh, in May, uh, the Russian and Chinese leadership has announced the launch of the new uh, project One Bell, One Road initiative, which would unite these uh, um, so-called Silk Way 
uh, project in China with the Russia with Russia's or more uh, specifically Eurasian economic space, the project that has been advocated by Russia. So the question is, how promising is that, right? Uh, since the announcement in May, in August, the delegations, uh, Chinese and Russian delegations met and decided to proceed with the roadmap. But when I tried to speak about that with Russian experts in China and on Russian economy, actually the response that I was getting from them that we have no idea where this is going to lead us because we don't have any roadmap at the moment, unfortunately. So everything I was gonna, I I'm going to say today is really speculative, so keep that in mind. So what is the idea about? Uh, so first of all, the idea of this one belt, one, uh, one, belt, one road um, um, project um, uh, includes in it very large infrastructural project. One of the biggest ideas would include the uh, high-speed um, uh, highway in between Russia and China that would ideally start with Moscow Kazan hi uh, highway and finally end up leaning, linking uh, Beijing and Moscow. This is definitely a very uh, promising idea, very um, ambitious in a way, uh, but also very long term. The pr prospective projects will take prob prob pr approximately eight to ten years. Uh, China has also launched a special foundation with capital approximating $40 trillion, which would invest in that infrastructure. Here actually the question is, uh, the overall uh, cost of this ambitious infrastructure project at the moment uh, is estimated at the level of $240 trillion, right? And the foundation only has $40 uh, trillion, which is quite a substantive amount of money, but still not substantive enough to actually implement those works. So this is so ma one major part of this devel uh, development is the infrastructure project. The second one, eliminating the uh, trade barriers, improving the uh, custom services uh, relations between China and Russia, and the third uh, project would include a creation of system of protection of the investment. Uh, Chinese and Russian investors who currently collaborate they complain a lot about the lack of um, uh, basically establish relationships with uh, relationship between these uh, custom services. Um, problem is that uh, because of this ambitiousness of the project, right, and given the past track record uh, of similar projects, it's very unlikely that it's going to be as successful as it is promised, right? In general, the idea is that Russia will become a m uh, like one important partner in Russia, in uh, Chinese um, current task to create a road, a trade road from China, uh, that will go from China through Central Asia and to Europe, right? One obvious problem with that, that if you looked to the actual uh, idea, the way China views it, if you look at the pictures of the project, all of the main roads at the moment at least go through the Central Asia, they don't even touch uh, Russia. So it is very unclear whether it will be possible to integrate those two projects together. But the major issue, issue, issue which I was going to talk today about lies actually within the um, economic relations between China and Russia. And as we know, f as of now, they have not been that successful lately. So when last year Russia decided to expand its geopolitical ambitions and entered Ukraine, probably you'll remember that it also announced that it was turning away from Europe, from the West, and trying to actually reestablish the relationship with China, right? So as of now, uh, more than over a year after uh, that announcement, we can actually already have certain kind of um, um, results that will allow us to estimate how efficient the uh, development w was. Uh, so first of all, Russia is by far not the main and not the most important trade partner for China. Uh, the commodity uh, turnover with, ch with um, Russia constitutes about $95 trillion, and that uh, means that Russia is about 90th uh, partner in the list of mo major uh, Chinese trade partners. The main one is, of course, the United States. And for Russia, that means that whatever it takes, 
but China is not ever going to support Russia's geopolitical ambitions because that would w threaten or put in danger its uh, relations with its main trade partner, the United States. And we uh, kind of saw it already this in the last year. What has happened is that once the um, Russian markets, uh, because of the Western sanctions, were essentially uh, cut off the West of, uh, funding, uh, the Russian investors and the Russian governments immediately went to Hong Kong and to China asking for credits, right? And they thought that they'll get a lot of those credits from their Asian partners. This is unfortunately not at all what has happened. Um, in Hong Kong, for example, even now, the ba bankers, the investors are reluctant to give credits to the uh, to people with Russian passports. Uh, in China as well, the the private banks refuse to give credits to Russia's companies that are under the Western sanctions. That is, again, because of that same uh, reason that I emphasized above. Uh, the United States and the West in general are the main uh, trade partners for the, the ch with China, and China is not risking to uh, not risking its uh, partnership with uh, the West because of Russia. That definitely going to uh, this is definitely the partner is going to continue in the future in the relationships uh, in the relations of our two countries. So sanctions definitely didn't help Russia, and they didn't really bring as much change as the Russian government at least has expected. A lot of the announcement that uh, the Chinese authorities make do not really lead to any result. Uh, second problem is the economic situation in China uh, as well. Uh, we know that there's certain kind of turmoil. There was certain kind of turmoil recently on the uh, Chinese financial markets, and uh, uh, that means that the Chinese demand for oil and for other natural resources will keep falling. For Russia, that means that the commodity uh, turnover with uh, 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 with China will also keep falling. That's not also looking that promising. Uh, finally, uh, there's also crisis in Russia because of the uh, different combination of the factors, sanctions included, but mostly because of the internal domestic problems with this within Russia's economy. Uh, because of Russia's crisis, in the first uh, half a year in 2015, the import from China has fallen by 36% already. So that really doesn't look like a very uh, promising uh, cooperation with, um, at least for the moment. And of course, uh, the very fact that the uh, oil prices keep falling, they have fallen by, uh, actually they shrink twice in the last year, as you know. Uh, that also means that the uh, um, Russia's um, export to China fell dramatically in this year. Uh, that in turn uh, put under uh, threat the most ambitious project that Russia was planning to conclude with China, which is the um, uh, the uh, this big infrastructural project of gas supplies, Sila uh, Sibiri, the strength of Siberia, I guess it's called. Um, Currently, the Russian authorities t hope to renegotiate uh, the gas price that had been in the initial contract uh, concluded with China last year. Uh, China, at the same time, is reluctant to renegotiate that price uh, because it is not very profitable for it. China has access to cheap uh, gas, relatively g cheap gas from uh, Turkmenistan, from Central Asia, and frankly, frankly, it really doesn't need uh, uh, Russia's gas with higher prices. So finally, as I said, there's also the sanction factor, which l uh, puts obstacles on collaboration with China. So overall, uh, as we can see, that really doesn't um, make, at least at the moment, uh, the prospects of collaboration between China and Russia do not look as promising as they um, actually were announced. From this perspective, and given all this uh, actually very shrinking, uh, very dramatically shrinking economic cooperation, we see that um, our countries uh, try to reorient to big geopolitical announcement. And from that perspective, this announcement of the One Belt, One Road initiative uh, basically, uh, to a large extent, has to do with the failure of these countries to increase the cooperation in other areas, in other economic areas that I have described. 
problem is, of course, uh, whether these announcements remain announcements. It is also true that in the last decade we have seen multiple big projects announced and even at the very beginning of the realization, uh, once again, BRICS is probably one most notorious example, but there are many of them. They rarely lead to certain kind of uh, material outcome. Um, so what actually can go wrong about this uh, uh, One Belt, uh, One World cooperation with, uh, Eurasia, uh, with the Eurasian Union? Uh, first of all, don't forget that Russia is really a small co economy compared to China, right? Russia's uh, uh, GDP is about two trillion uh, dollars as opposed to Chinese GDP, which is about nine uh, trillion dollars. So it's m more than four times uh, Russia's GDP. In a situation like that, you would expect that if uh, the free economic zone is established between Russian and Chinese markets, imagine ideal scenario, uh, the Russian uh, producers will be really endangered because Russian uh, producers to, to a large extent can, except for very few areas, cannot really compete with the quality and especially the cost of production of the Chinese uh, imports. That's a danger and it's unclear how the governments are going to solve that. Um, uh, another problem, as I said, the infrastructure. Uh, although this big idea to create this whole highway in between Beijing and Moscow is very promising and ambitious, but the main interest of China lies in establishing the highways and the infrastructure project w in Central Asian uh, countries that would create this Silk Road to Europe. That's is, that is the idea. It is really not very, cl uh, not very clear how exactly uh, Russia fits in and how does this Moscow-Beijing uh, ambitious highway fits in. Uh, now the timing is not good either, as I said, uh, because the economic uh, prospects for both countries at the moment do not look really promising. If the project was announced like maybe, uh, I don't know, five years ago, we definitely maybe look at it differently. Right now, so many ambitions with so little resources do not really look very persuasive. Now, another um, important area that should be considered is the recent announcement of the Trans-Pacific Partnership that has been made by the United States, right? This is really uh, a great and ambitious idea. Um, uh, the United States, together with, all together with other 11 countries, ha will establish an absolutely free economic zone for the um, countries of the um, uh, Asian Pacific region. Um, and uh, the, that project is really unusual on many dimensions. Uh, first and foremost, it really uh, uh, strongly and radically eliminates uh, the uh, typical uh, traditional trade barriers and the bureaucracy associated to that. It also demands, it also puts um, obstacles to local governments trying to essentially copy the technologies used by the foreign companies or trying to impose certain limits on the information control, on the internet control. So essentially it's more than just a business project, it's uh, the whole uh, big uh, kind of political economic idea that will really attempt to create an uh, uh, economic, free economic space in the um, trans-Pacific uh, region. Uh, for China, that means that this new competi competing uh, very strong force entering its traditional markets. For China, it is a real challenge and a competition. Uh, and although the, uh, the region per se is not really, um, has nothing to do with Russia, that also represents a huge challenge to Russia and its idea of the Eurasian uh, association with China. Why? Uh, that's because China will supposedly be forced to compete with this uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership by also opening up its uh, existing limitations, existing trade barriers, and to opening up to more transparency. It is very likely that uh, China will start to adapting slowly to the new rules imposed by this more pro-Western uh, pro type of the partnership. And that means uh, that Russia with um, its kind of corrupt, uh, corrupted schemes, its relatively high trade barriers, etc., will just be not able to compete. And this is definitely another challenge that uh, will probably see um, uh, Russia and China trying to basically uh, approach in the near future. 
Finally, let us also say a couple of words about the Eurasian Economic Union per se, right? How does it fit in uh, with, this, with China? Are there really areas for cooperation? So the Eurasian Economic Union, as you know, is a project mainly advocated by Russia for the last decade, which uh, attempts to unite the uh, um, uh, former Soviet republics into more or less uh, unified economic space. Uh, the project, however, has been developing quite slowly with relative success, and its economic benefits were not that clear from the start. So the economists actually, the Russian economists estimate the potential benefits of the Russian economy from the Eurasian Economic Union from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 percent GDP, which is great if, I mean, if it was possible, not, not, not that much, but still good if it was possible to achieve that. Uh, however, um, uh, we, uh, in the last um, four years, instead of actually increasing um, trade, um, uh, commodity turnover between uh, the countries in the, in the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, we instead saw the uh, commodity turnover declining. Uh, the countries such as Kazakhstan and even Belarus actually tend to increase the turnover with other countries outside of the EU more actively than with the countries within the EU itself. Uh, plus, because, because Russia represents really 80% of the economy of the Eurasian economic space, the, um, um, the recession in, in Russia that has been going on for the last two, three years, well, I mean, small recession, maybe not as obvious uh, in terms of the GDP growth, but uh, more obvious in terms of its uh, trade uh, capacity. That recession has affected the development of the Eurasian economic space quite dramatically. So from 2011 to 2012, so in 2011, uh, the uh, commodity turnover in the Eurasian economic, uh, what actually at the, at the moment was called still custom union, was $63 trillion. Uh, dollars. In 2012, it gr grew a little bit and uh, constituted $68 trillion. By 2013, it's already started declining by $64 uh, trillion. Dollars. I don't have data for 2014, but I do know that Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakhstan's turnover with, with Russia and Belarus in, 2000, in 2014 has decreased by 20%. And Kazakhstan turnover with uh, the Eurasian economic space in 2015, in the first half of the 2000 of, of this year, has already also decreased by 20 percent. So the Eurasian economic space is not really doing well, and there's a reason f for it actually, uh, because as we know, the Eurasian economic space is not an economic project. It's most, uh, it's primarily is a geopolitical project created by Russia in order to basically show that it is not alone in its a geopolitical position in the world. It's an attempt to unite, uh, to <coughs> reunite the, f the former Soviet countries and, uh, so to say, to re-establish its um, economic and political influence in this space. That is one major region, reason why Russia was so um, upset about, the Uc about Ukraine's decision not to join the EU in 2013, that led, as we know, to very unfortunate developments uh, between our two countries. Uh, so from this perspective, the EU is not really an economic space, that efficient of an economic space to begin with, and it is not doing really well. Uh, among other problems within this EU space, you can also emphasize low competitiveness of the, uh, of the products, uh, low, uh, the countries tend to be actually, the, within the EU, the EU country ten, countries tend to be more attracted by the markets with lower costs. Uh, and that also means that they uh, actually reorient themselves, part at, least, at least part of these countries reorient them to China. Uh, here, of course, I'm talking f first and foremost about Kazakhstan, uh, whose uh, commodity to know with China has been growing faster than its turn trade turnover with um, the rest of the EU countries in the past. 
right? So for given the low economic prospects of the uh, EU project and the high uh, competition, high challenge that the Chinese economy represents to it, it is really not very clear how exactly the integration is meant uh, to proceed because it is clear that given this uh, imbalance in the trade potential of the countries, China is going to definitely uh, win uh, and basically just uh, de uh, destroy the local producers in these economies. So also given the low competitiveness of the EU market, the uh, uh, custom union, the, the EU space that was initially kind of designed to model the uh, Eurozone, the, the European Union, actually, so that's free, the area of free um, trade with no customs, no, with low taxes, etc., switched to uh, the model which, uh, sw switched to the opposite model, which is uh, very protectionist. So in the last year, for example, um, the uh, EU was more concerned with protecting its markets from the outside uh, products than, f when than f with developing its competitiveness. Uh, this has also to do with the fact that Russia, because of its uh, Ukrainian actions, got under, at, under Western sanctions, and uh, it had to protect its markets from, it had to introduce these anti-Western anti sanctions that prohibited this trade, the import of certain Western goods. Right. For EEU, it represented a particular challenge because the uh, um, other countries would did, wouldn't agree with that, uh, with uh, basically uh, getting rid of certain uh, Western products because Russia, because Russia couldn't, was not in good uh, relationship with the, uh, with the European Union. So that resulted in major conflicts within e uh, EEU when Belarus was insisting that it could uh, import certain markets from uh, European Union and could basically uh, send them to Kazakhstan through Russia's territory. Russia is saying that Belarus could not do that and uh, actually already uh, s the conflicts began. Because Belarus and especially President Lukashenko is so dependent on Putin, uh, Russia has been able to resolve this problem at the moment. But it is very unlikely that in the future the, um, the solution will be as obvious. So as you can see, the actually the very nature of the EEU kind of puts the whole idea of negotiating with uh, China and with participating in this free economic space with China uh, very um, unlikely. Uh, because first of all, the local markets of these very really not very competitive countries will be destroyed. Uh, and uh, most likely the countries will not agree with that to begin with. And we kind of already saw it on this example of the... Um, uh, of this conflict within the EU in the last uh, period of time. So just to conclude, given ev all these factors, it's not very clear to me whether the success of the um, Chinese Russia, uh, Ch China EU integration is, go is going to be imminent in the near future. Let's put it mildly. It is though we'll definitely we'll definitely hear more speculation about that because once again, the one reason, one major. Um, motivation behind creating such a big project is geopolitical ambitions and try and overcompensate absence of actions with a lot of words and uh, a lot of beautiful narratives. So that's about all I have to say about this well, topic. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, unfortunately, our other speaker has not arrived yet, so uh, it's going to be, instead of a comparative study, a, a, a perspective from, the, from Russia and I think we'll have to delve into the Chinese perspective during Q&A here. But, but it was very interesting to hear about the protectionist tendencies within the EEU, because I think that's one of the underestimated factors in the creation of the Eurasian Economic Union. And it's been very interesting that in order for Kazakhstan and for Kyrgyzstan now to join the EEU, they had to raise their tariff rates vis-a-vis -vis China. Yeah. And that therefore, in fact, in terms of promoting trade between the EEU and China, um, the Eurasia Union represents a new obstacle because you do have these new tariff rates that are being imposed or the Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan have agreed upon that will actually limit their trade um, with, uh, with China. I, I guess, th and that leads me to the question about the dynamics of this relationship as it evolves. Again, uh, we're going to focus obviously now on the Russia side. But really, um, 
when you take into consideration all your arguments about where Russia stands currently vis-a-vis -vis China, um, is Russia simply doomed to be the junior partner? And from a political standpoint, can Russia really be anyone's junior partner <laughs> in, an, in, in, in such a relationship? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Uh, so yeah, so the maj major Russia's Russia's major Russia's leadership ma uh, motivation, as we have witnessed it in the last uh, years, is forced more for most geopolitical, uh, political, not economic. And the reason behind is actually Russia's inability, with Russia's current leadership, inability to reform the economy. And I think that's really important uh, factor that I didn't have a chance to underline uh, in my discussion is that. Russia's uh, political system is based on uh, redistribution from the low, from actually from business, from the lower uh, levels of the society to the ruling authorities, to the ruling bureaucracy. The uh, it's done through taxes or corruption, bribes, and other uh, um, uh, different approaches. In this, in system like in a system like that, uh, you really are unlikely to see any kind of. Uh, uh, reforms because the reforms would undermine the uh, support, the main support base of the uh, of the of uh, um, of the leadership. And because the Russian leadership, the Kremlin's main goal is definitely to stay in power for as long as it takes, uh, the reforms and any kind of institutional transparency are unlikely in the near future. Although, although experts and people keep talking about it. Uh, the Russian leadership, though, does not talk about the reforms as much right now. All they talk about is that is the expectation of the high oil prices in the near future. So that's that's the real quasi-religious belief that they kind of will bounce back and everything will be fine, and then and hence we don't need any reforms, we don't need any cuts, everything is going to be all right. So that means for us that the situation will, as opposed to China, will more or less uh, remain the same in the near future. Uh, so the China will keep developing because China is different kind of political system. It will again not find it very interesting to join Russia's geopolitical ambitions, not at least now. Uh, because that would isolate its Western partners, and that's what China is really concerned about. And of course, as I said, there's also the Trans-Pacific Partnership that's likely to, again, represent another challenge to China and basically push it into more uh, institutional reforms and more transparency, so push it most into more Western uh, uh, st style of business. And hence, again, uh, by expanding this uh, um, difference with uh, Russia. So yeah, I think that uh, the words will st remain, will stay words. We'll definitely see more ambitious announcement of large projects or success that has been achieved recently in signing this memorandum of that uh, or that contract. But it is unlikely, really, in the near future, to lead to any kind of outcome. We'll definitely not see any kind of evil access between China and Russia. Well, thanks, Maria. We're, we'll open the floor to questions. Usually, I don't encourage comments, but obviously, if we can uh, bring in the comments, there, if someone wants to bring in more of the China perspective into the discussion, and I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, a little bit more generous than I am in the past. So, right there, Bill. Uh, Bill Veal, I'm uh, president emeritus of the U.S. Kazakhstan Business Association. And I'm not going to go where Will would like me to go here. I'd, I'd like to sort of focus a little bit more on the uh, European, uh, sorry, on the, on the Eurasian Economic Union and uh, Kazakhstan's relations with, with Russia. Uh, given the nationalism that uh, Putin has awakened in uh, Russia uh, in recent years, uh, what is the extent to which uh, any uh, entrepreneurial class can look at this situation that you've described and uh, notice that a country like Kazakhstan, which has uh, sought to attract foreign investment by saying we have the best investment climate in uh, the Union. Uh, what, and the fact that the kind of deal that was struck did allow for free movement of uh, labor, skilled labor particularly, and capital and whatnot. Uh, do you see any signs of Russian uh, investors uh, looking at Kazakhstan as a place to do uh, business uh, freed of some of the constraints of doing business in Putin's Russia? 
Oh, yes, for sure. it's a great question. Thank you very much. Yeah, definitely, they already do that. There's uh, some data, unfortunately, I have it with me, uh, that shows that uh, the Russian uh, investments actually leave and Kazakhstan is one of the destinations. Kazakhstan is like this ideal world where Russia's businessmen would love to be, but since they're not there, uh, in Russia, so that they actually often choose to move there. And I was going to raise this uh, other point that Kazakhstan is the only factor that actually might bring some potential in this Chinese-EU uh, relations in the future, because Kazakhstan is the one country that is definitely interested in further integration with uh, China. Uh, Russia has imposed uh, the EU on Kazakhstan, as we have discussed, as we have mentioned before, and it's not really obvious, um, and it does not really bring obvious benefits to Kazakhstan, but this uh, certain geopolitical realities where Nazarbayev kind of has to comply. Uh, that's one reason, uh, but uh, because of China represents so much potential for Kazakhstan markets and the further integration uh, also does, we do, we are likely to see Kazakhstan pushing further in that, in that direction. Actually, I think earlier this month, um, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakhstan uh, one of the high-level Kazakhstan officials has actually suggested that the uh, that the countries accelerate the roadmap of the uh, regarding the integration of the EEU and uh, the One Belt One Road uh, initiative. And that's again it's hard to comment on it since we haven't seen the roadmap yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's one reason, one big factor why we can see certain kind of progress in that direction. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, for one brief point, I mean, I think Russians were making major inroads into Kazakhstan, and that's one of the reasons why Kazakhstan decided to unilaterally uh, devalue its currency, that the ruble was getting so cheap that it was actually had a trade mm -hmm. advantage going into mm -hmm. Kazakhstan, and that therefore the decision was made by Nazarbayev to unilaterally uh, devalue its, its currency. My name's Thomas Grindley. Since the dissolution of the USSR, what have been the main changes in trade relations between Russia and China, both qualitatively and quantitatively? Um, well, uh, I would say the one big obvious change is the a huge increase in the in the trade uh, between the two countries because the Soviet Union, despite the uh, collaboration with China on certain areas, didn't really have an open economy, the open transparent borders. Right now, the the trade has definitely intensified. Um, uh, there's also kind of very prospective relation, uh, as, as we talk about the areas of uh, prospective collaboration with China, it is also, and it's also a change, um, Soviet Union, after all, was in this industrialized economy, and the major um, uh, relations with China were uh, in this uh, in the supply of the industrial uh, products. Today, Russia is first and foremost a natural resource exporter, and that's in that's in which capacity China actually needs it, right? If it needs Russia's oil, or actually relatively expensive oil, oil and gas, uh, at all. It needs uh, only that from Russia. That, by the way, is also potential limitation for Chinese Russia's uh, economic cooperation. If China, uh, if Russia suddenly, after all, decides to develop as its productive capacity uh, potential in the future, uh, that will definitely make uh, Russia compete with China on many markets, and that's a problem too. So they are potential competitors. Not now when Russia mostly exports its resources, but in the future if the industry uh, develops further. At the moment, uh, as we talk about the industrial uh, products that Russia exports, there's still a lot of, a little bit um, um, uh, of some opportunity in terms of timing in supply of the weapons uh, to China, because some of the Chinese industries are still catching up uh, in the military area. So this is where the major uh, major um, uh, trade-off lies uh, lies today. Right here. Thank you. Um, on the note of uh, competing for markets, last uh, last month actually, I believe it was Costco and China Merchants um, International acquired the um, third largest port in Turkey. 
along with this kind of acquisition and the creation of this so-called Great Stone Industrial Park in Belarus, alongside Chinese, the, um, alongside Chinese investors, how do you think Russia would react in the future? Should it recover economically, having to deal with all of these Chinese kind of um, portals, economic portals around its periphery? Well, I mean, that also depends on the political situation, not only on the economic situation, right? Because the major reason why Russia has been reoriented itself to China in the last uh, uh, years is the uh, um, its inability to sustain good re relations with the West, right? And uh, we have actually witnessed quite uh, our Russia's officials kind of overcoming huge psychological barriers uh, with regards to their cooperation with Chinese investors, right? For example, they have allowed uh, uh, the um, minority Chinese ownership of certain uh, strategic industries in the uh, in certain uh, areas of Russia's um, uh, uh, Russia's economy, where previously it was just unthinkable. So, given that, uh, b b because Russia essentially lacks partners, it has to do whatever it takes to please China, right? So, given that, if the current um, uh, kind of strained relations with the West continue in the near future, we are not likely to uh, see Russia reacting that harshly against China, which I think is a mistake. If you ask me, I think it's a mistake because it's, uh, again, kind of China is is more of a competitor in the future for Russia given their uh, relative uh, economies, uh, economic potential. But because geopo geopolitics kind of rules Russia's economic decision making at the moment, uh, that's the outcome we have to deal with. Well, we've been joined by uh, pr Professor uh, Ziang, uh, who is director of the Center of One Belt and One Road Studies. Um, we're going to give him the floor now for about 10 minutes. <laughs> Uh, we've had a very thorough and comprehensive discussion on Russia's perspective, uh, where Maria has raised some of the questions and doubts about the viability of future Russian-Chinese economic relations, um, and has outlined some of the problems dealing with the BRICS and the Eurasian Economic Union and so forth. Right. Uh, so uh, we were, we're going out of sequence, but um, <laughs> Professor Ziang, the floor is yours to, uh, to bring in the Chinese perspective. Thank you, thank you. I, uh, I don't know why I, I got the letter this morning, it says starting at the fall. So <laughs> I still have, but anyway, some confusion here. I, I thought I don't have a problem. The, uh, yes, thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, uh, I, I, I simply want to say a couple of things. One is that uh, the concept of Euro-Asia is something relatively new. Um, I, I don't think Chinese uh, leadership are particularly familiar with that idea. Um, uh, if you look at Chinese uh, language translation, it's very awkward. Um, it, it does not distinguish between uh, what, what the Russian considered Eurasia and uh, Europe and Asia together. Right? So, in other words, we don't. Uh, the uh, in, in in our uh, concept does not necessarily. Uh, exclude uh, West, Western Europe uh, and Eastern Europe. But um, since the uh, People's Republic was founded, of course, as we all know, that this is uh, mostly one single country, the Soviet Union and the Chinese-Russian uh, relationship has never been r really smooth. Uh, I used to say that the China-Russian relationship today is the best, but I want to add since Catherine the Great, uh, meaning that they never really like each other throughout uh, in the centuries. <laughs> there is not a single moment you, you can really call it a honeymoon period, not even including the period of uh, the only alliance Chinese had uh, with Russia in the 50s. The relationship is always in tension, and uh, Euro-Asia is not a concept that Chinese uh, use to uh, formulate its policy either towards Russia or towards uh, Europe. So it is rather a, uh, um, it's a fictional concept. Okay. Until I think uh, the turning point probably is uh, 2003, 2004. Now at that point, I think the, uh, what's interesting uh, is for the Chinese to see that uh, uh, there is a chance that the 
Euro-Asian mainland uh, had a chance to come together uh, because for the first time there, there is, uh, seemed to be no major geopolitical conflict among major powers, especially from a Chinese point of view. The 2003 is critical because in that year there emerged in the UN Security Council and the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the debate over Iraq. Uh, what, what is emerging during that uh, event is a quasi-diplomatic entente against uh, the uh, Anglo-American uh, war efforts uh, uh, over Iraq. Now, this is at the moment, I think, uh, for, for, uh, from my perspective, fundamentally changed Chinese perspective. That's to say two things. One is West really is a two not one West. You have a, um, the, uh, a more jingoistic <laughs> uh, a West, then you have a more uh, a Pacific West. And th it's possible they don't agree with each other. And this, the, the UN debate, of course, played a very important role for China to reassess its policy towards Europe and towards Asia, uh, the, the Euro-Asia and, uh, and, 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 and Russia as well. Uh, so what uh, emerged from that event is that uh, uh, Chinese leadership decided to designate the year of 2004 as the year of uh, EU. Well, in the past, the Chinese do not really uh, take EU uh, too seriously. I'm not saying China has no, never had good relations with EU countries, but uh, Brussels, meaning the multilateral institutions, is not in the cards for Chinese for many, many decades. Uh, we know during the Cold War, this is what uh, Chinese uh, reputation is uh, so known as a G1 country, meaning basically do whatever we want to do. They tried one alliance with Russia, which has failed, uh, as we know, uh, in the 60s. Uh, so it is very much a self-sufficient, independent, autonomous kind of uh, foreign policy. Multilateralism is not something uh, usually in the cards. They, they deal with Europe integration process, but they're usually dealing with uh, capitals of those powers, uh, rather than dealing with a multilateral institution like the European Union. Uh, but that uh, single event, in my view, changed perspective. China began what I would call, uh, at the time, uh, I wrote a long piece, that China may have started a Euro-Asian experiment and that experiment including three uh, elements. One is uh, improvement of the relationship between China and, and, and the Russia. They, they made enormous efforts to resolve their historic problems um, and the many other issues. Um, I think the, this is a remarkable achievement. Uh, we all together, we had uh, something like 7,700 uh, <laughs> border disputes well, compared with what we see today. Uh, the, the little problem, little rock, East China Sea, <laughs> South China Sea, and the other issues. Uh, this, these are the peanuts. But with Russia, it's a real issue uh, of, of a territorial dispute. But then, after a patient negotiations, uh, they actually so solved most of them. My understanding is about seven and a half left. Um, uh, I'm sure Mr. Putin has good reason to complain why there is no Nobel Peace Prize there. Um, it, it's a secret, well, it's a, it's a not uh, open negotiation, but it's a serious uh, effort on both sides to resolve their historic problems. And the China and the Russia on, on, on these uh, bilateral relationships, good bilateral relationships that began also move on the second pillar of the Euro-Asian politics, that is to create a a Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which, as we know, um, has created uh, um, earlier than the, the, the Iraq war, but then speed up, uh, accelerate, and today that organization turned out to be quite a success um, beyond expectations. We have more members coming in uh, or interested, including even uh, Pakistan and India. So uh, the third, of course, is the relationship uh, between Russia and Europe, uh, despite the recent setback over uh, Ukraine. Um, 
the Treaty of Amsterdam of the EU has already set this basic tone of a grand strategy between EU and, and Russia. So, you know, through all these building of the bridges, from a Chinese point of view, Euro-Asia turned out to be the ideal bridge for China to have a soft landing uh, in the uh, on, uh, in, in the process of integrating into international uh, system. So that also means they have to strike a balance between uh, Asia, the Pacific region where China, there is a lot of muddy waters, so to speak, <laughs> then they, ha they, they, they began to pursue a continental strategy since then uh, to balance what is uh, overly uh, rely upon the relationship between Washington and Beijing. Because the Chinese dipl diplomatic cliche is uh, uh, the only thing we need to do uh, for a long time, the Beige uh, Washington, <laughs> Washington and the Washington. The only problem between China and the United States is Taiwan, Taiwan and the Taiwan. Um, if we solve these problems, no problem. The other <laughs> issue is not important. Uh, uh, but as we can see, these, these issues have not been solved and uh, um, on the other hand, the China's Euro-Asian strategy began to flourish. Okay. So this is, I think, it's, this is not a direct response to American recent pivot, as many uh, uh, Western scholars or American scholars try to argue about the One Belt, One Road uh, project, or uh, some, sometimes dubbed as a new Silk Road project. It's not a immediate response to that because that's a much later uh, story. Uh, it is based on the original uh, uh, Euro-Asian strategy, the grand strategy uh, as a whole. Now, uh, let me just try to uh, uh, emphasize uh, the other point um, about China and, and, and the Russia here. Why the relationship is so good uh, recently I think the old analysis that uh, China and Russia could never really get along, that, uh, but they are um, to the be well, to say the, the, the best would be a marriage of convenience. They just use each other for you know, temporary purposes. They're going to split again. There is no chance this relationship will consolidate. Uh, that kind of analysis, I think it's... Uh, 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 it's up, uh, out, outdated. China and the Russia, and the, the since, in my view, since the Iraq War, uh, really began to develop a relationship that is based on common, uh, uh, rather solid, common interests. Uh, it's not just the economic issues. Economically, China, and Russia, uh, roughly uh, complementary each other. You know, each side provide the other side needs. But also, also I think, uh, referring to global governance, and um, I think China and Russia began to develop an uh, increasingly closer outlook. Uh, the best expression, I think, is, is, is made by uh, Putin in the recent UN, UN uh, meeting. Uh, that is focusing on the issue of regime change. It's not a question you get rid of somebody, but you can settle the issue if you can. Uh, if you want to get rid of somebody, <laughs> you can settle the problem f of that country. If you cannot, forget about it. Uh, you, have to, uh, you have to be careful. And you, 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 no member's international community has rights to say a, a particular regime has no legitimacy <laughs> uh, to exist. And the Chinese, uh, the People's Republic, of course, has been uh, struggling with this issue of legitimacy for many, many decades uh, because the concept of political legitimacy is only defined in post-enlightenment uh, uh, political theology. Uh, I would sometimes call it uh, Gothic theory of democracy. Um, and uh, that is not something I think uh, uh, the... Uh, Renaissance humanism uh, uh, during the earlier period of Enlightenment Europeans uh, thought about China. Here I'm particularly say it's the Jesuit view of China uh, in the 16th century, uh, which is stri strikingly different from what is the contemporary view uh, on China, uh, uh, Chinese political legitimacy. Uh, I think Pope perhaps is the only one who understands that uh, today. But that's, you know, that's the issue, uh, it's debatable, but the basic point I think is that uh, the 
what is the basic principle of a, of a, of a global governance? Okay. Um, China and Russia, for the first time, in my view, really began to uh, 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 the meeting of the minds, and I'm sure the leadership also played a very important role. The two leaders have excellent chemistry. Uh, the chemistry is uh, quite uh, uh, amazing. Uh, uh, then you, we have the c uh, sharp contrast with the uh, uh, President Xi and Obama, which uh, obviously very little chemistry. And uh, so, yes, there is a leadership uh, uh, characters. N nobody's right, nobody's wrong, but simply saying the chemistry is not there. And of course, strategic trust issue. Okay. Um, Ken Lieberthal uh, uh, some times ago says there is no you know, there's only distrust between China and the United States. So do not let us uh, entertain the idea there is a strategic uh, uh, trust. So they have to start from there. Uh, so I, I, I think this is uh, Ukraine event and uh, many other events and pivot in Asia for the f uh, really both, uh, I think, uh, uh, pushed the two countries together uh, much closer as well. But this is just uh, um, uh, a historic accident, but it's not uh, inevitable. Uh, but uh, I, I think China and Russia are really on the same page on many uh, international issues, besides economic, mutual economic interests. So this is why uh, Mr. even Ms. Putin changed his mind uh, about the oval, about the one belt, one road near Silk Road. Uh, Russians don't really. At the beginning, they did not like it, <laughs> I must say. Uh, they prefer their project, Euro-Asian Union. And um, uh, that is the China Chinese New Silk Road projects considered a, a competitor rather than complementing uh, the Euro-Asian Union for quite some time. But uh, um, it seemed to me uh, Mr. Putin changed quite dramatically uh, the last few months, especially during the uh, military parade uh, the Moscow uh, Mr. Xi was there uh, they announced the two projects can actually uh, I think the word is coupling probably <laughs> they are complementing each other they're going to meet with each other uh, the Eurasian Union and the, um, and the new Silk Road so there are you know the trend is uh, uh, beyond the uh, the uh, anyone's expectation uh, between China and uh, Russia. So I think the, the foundation of the relationship is much solid that uh, outsiders seem to uh, suggest. I think I'll stop here. Well, thanks Thank so you. much. Uh, yeah. We've gone out of order, but we're going to give <laughs> Maria another <laughs> chance to uh, <laughs> comment on right. Professor uh, Xiang's comments and to kind of uh, bring the two presentations closer together, together, two narratives together, yes. exactly. Uh, Professor Xiang, I really wanted to thank you for basically doing a great job in emphasizing the main point that I was making here earlier on that in general, all these uh, big uh, ambitious projects has very l have very little to do with the economic factors, but have everything to do with geopolitics, right? And that's why we've heard so many words about international relations, chemistry, and geopolitics in your presentation, rather than about the actual economic factors and economic motivation behind the integration of the two countries, right? You didn't s s say, for example, how would the EU, e EU with its protectionist nature and the high uh, barriers to trade fit in this uh, Chinese vision of this uh, free economic space, et cetera, et cetera. But I just wanted to quote uh, with this uh, regard uh, Alex Alexander Cooley, who is a professor at the Columbia School Harman um, Institute, who recently published a brilliant article at the Journal for Democracy, and he, where he says that uh, the recent uh, the autoc autocrats in the contemporary world have become surprisingly adept at neutralizing and subverting the institutions that have traditionally upheld democratic norms. And one of the examples he uses in his article, exactly creation of these international institutions that kind of aim at uh, increasing the economic collaboration, but in fact, that are used to strengthen these regional uh, autocrats, you know, and attempt to create alternative institutions by 
justifying cracking down on NGOs and supporting the authoritarian regimes. So basically those international institutions like BRICS uh, and potentially also the uh, one that we are currently discussing provides justification and legitimacy to the autocrats as opposed to the Western societies. So I would be really interested in your reaction to this. Uh, yes, well, I, I actually agree with you totally. I mean, the institution building has been quite uh, uh, steadily and uh, 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 yes, we have uh, several institutional uh, mechanisms now linking Russia and, uh, and China. You, you mentioned BRICS, of course. Uh, also, uh, we look at this, this, uh, some uh, important uh, uh, new uh, banks uh, concerning infrastructure. And uh, we, I, I think what's interesting about this is China, the oboe, I mean, uh, since I'm running a center <laughs> in Shanghai, uh, I, I call it uh, Obo, one belt, one road, sorry. To <laughs> the Obo project uh, is not a re repetition of the 19th century, uh, the uh, European concept, which uh, uh, we talk about Baghdad Railway, <laughs> talking about Panama Canal, uh, or Suez, or even Count Vita, uh, for the trans siberian Railway. It's very different from those projects. And uh, it is the idea of um, uh, infrastructure investment-led growth, try to create an economic belt or economic region uh, to stimulate the uh, a trade relationship among about 60 countries. Now, in this uh, 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 three, the, the officially, this new Silk Road uh, cover the three the land-based, okay, and the one is maritime. Therefore, Russia is critically important. One a main part of that land-based uh, uh, project. Now, whether or not the project itself is going to be a great success, we still don't know yet. Uh, we don't have uh, many uh, empirical cases of success to, you know, to prove this work. But the idea seemed to be quite uh, interesting. Uh, that is to, um, to use uh, fin financial leveraging, unlike Wall Street leveraging, which is different, that's mortgage, uh, but it's, it's, it's a, a for in infrastructure investment, try to attract private capital in the project for building railways or ports or you know, basic infrastructure. This is the something that the European and the West has not done s uh, since the 19th century. So it's uh, something new. Uh, it, it's a leveraging of uh, 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 um, economic uh, uh, capacity, which is China, uh, uh, I would say, overcapacity. China exporting overcapacity. Uh, for not only for domestic purposes, but also try to create an uh, economic relationship. So, it, yeah, but in, in both cases, I think um, s these institutions, banking, uh, economic institutions, s as well as political institutions, are critically important here. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to uh, open the floor for some more questions here. Then, and let's take um, let's take these two questions together. Hi, my name is Leo, uh, Leo Luo from CSIS. Uh, just a quick clarification question. Uh, when you mentioned the grand strategy, China's grand strategy of for Eurasia, could you just mention like some quick texts or um, some other sources that actually mention the strategy in name? Oh, the, well, uh, one, one of the, um, the, the debate, well, actually the, the debate, I mean, uh, a, a leading uh, a professor in China called Wang Jisu, who is a top uh, expert on the United States, he, 2007, he used the expression of a uh, westward strategy, or you know, uh, China should uh, move to the west instead, you know, focus only on the east. Myself, I, I wrote things which is earlier than Wang Jisu. I, as I said, I coined the expression of a Euro-Asian experiment. Um, but there is quite many others also, you know, have done th the same kind of thing. Um, it is Mackindarian, maybe a little bit, but remember th the debate in China is that um, 
uh, first of all, we don't have Mahan, we don't have tear pits, and um, we don't have Mackinder either, <laughs> not yet. Uh, but the question is, how do you link this Euro-Asian strategy with infrastructure investment to the land uh, rights? Because when you build, uh, remember, when you build a railway, inevitably you have to involve some other countries' uh, land. Or in the case of maritime, you have inevitably involving in ports and uh, you know the naval uh, connecting points. Now, th how do you uh, explain this? So far, I don't think that these details has not yet been uh, carefully uh, studied. Uh, the basic line is that it is an economic development project. That's the that's the main motivation. Uh, uh, behind the Chinese uh, uh, project. But th there are a lot of writings on this, yes. Mm -hmm. right there. Christine Schenk, I work for the U.S. Navy. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how Russia's annexation of Ukraine has impacted the China-Russia relationship and also the China-Ukraine relationship. Well, that's the biggest surprise, I must say. Um, what Ru Russian, what Putin did about Ukraine uh, in the old days, I would say, that would be considered the worst uh, behavior the Chinese w can never tolerate. We go to war with Russia uh, in the 60s over, primarily over the issue of a Brezhnev doctrine. Means, you know, your big brother, you know, you can't go into the smaller country, you, t you, you say, you know, <laughs> We simply th there, you know, doing separatism, doing anything. This is, you remember the Czechoslovakia 68 played very, very important role of the rapid deterioration between Russia and China. We had so many uh, articles in China criticized, but this time it's very different. I, I think what's interesting about this, it, it's the assessment. How do you assess Euro Maidan? You know, the Maidan Square. I mean, the, what's happening there? I think China, it's my view, more or less agree with the Russians' assessment. Um, why should uh, somebody who's elected uh, simply kick out because the West don't like him? You may say it's the you know uprising and so on, but who is really behind? I don't know. Putin seemed to suggest he knows, but I <laughs> but it, it look very suspicious. Uh, and don't forget, China had their own problems uh, as well. <laughs> and before, and uh, so this is this is why I think uh, Chinese leader called Putin immediately after this Ukraine uh, affair. What he said, if you uh, trace his uh, telephone call, uh, which is public knowledge, basically saying we understand why you do this. Now, in Chinese way of talking, that's a very strong support. It's not just. Uh, uh, it's beyond the typical Chinese behavior uh, over these controversial issues at the UN. Chinese usually uh, hide behind the uh, polar bear. <laughs> Let Russians take the lead. We simply say, well, okay, <laughs> they abstain, we abstain, but l Russians take the lead. But in the Ukraine case, because it does touch upon the issue of political legitimacy and the Western, what is considered Western double standard about what is legitimacy. Vis a vis Yanukovych. So, this is how my reading of the uh, relationship. Yeah. <coughs> well, I'm, I'm going to bring the conversation. We're already a little over time here, so I'm going to bring it to a close, but I'm going to. My fault. Po pose, <laughs> no, no fault here at all. <laughs> I'm going to pose the same question to you in a different, slightly different way than I won um, <coughs> to Maria, and that is as you look at this relationship, does China view Russia as the junior partner? Uh, as what, what has often been described as when China gets together with the BRICS, it simply meets its, its suppliers. You know, and Russia is a supplier of raw materials. It's very nice, but it's not a banking leader. It's not a leader in industry. It's not a leader in, in services. It provides China with its raw materials, and China has multiple markets that it chooses from. So to what extent in this relationship that you're describing is China really beginning to see that it's not an equal relationship? Or, but views it itself as the dominant member of, of this uh, of this relationship. Uh, you, okay. You, yes. <laughs> I th I think you know in reality it certainly it's not quite a equal relationship, especially you know, um, my my recollections um, 
at uh, St. Petersburg uh, Economic uh, Forum, uh, which uh, one of uh, I was there. One of the Russian politicians not happy when I say China and Russian economies are compatible. Said, no, no, we don't like that expression. Compatible in Chinese way of talking is yes, as you said, you supply something, we provide manufacturing. So we have value add. You you only raw material, right? So we we we, we make money then much more than you do. Uh, that's what not the Russian one. But I think Chinese leader, especially and and uh, Mr. Xi Jinping, is very very sensitive on this issue. They tried extremely hard, I think to make the relationship look very, very uh, compatible, no, I mean, <laughs> uh, equal and uh, um, uh, f for a couple of things. One is the nostalgic, well, the, the, the sp emotional feeling about Russia, which is very strong for this generation, um, meaning my generation. <laughs> Many of them learned a uh, lot of stuff uh, through Russia when they grew up. These are the 50s generation. This, the second thing I think is, is important, uh, not just the emotional issue, is that is China, despite all the problems in Russia since the collapse of the Soviet Union, I don't think Chinese leaders ever uh, can afford to underestimate Russia uh, in the way Washington uh, did. Um, basically, <laughs> Washington said, no, it's a secondary power, medium power, regional power. Uh, China, uh, Russia, uh, China never thinks so. <laughs> Not only because we are, you know, that's a huge neighbor there. We cannot <laughs> ignore at all. We, we never can uh, really be comfortable to say, you know, <laughs> uh, Russia will not pose a threat in the future at some point. Uh, so that psychology also compelled China to treat Russia, uh, uh, you know, much more <laughs> seriously than than uh, it is. Uh, uh, if you want me to add one more thing here is the history here is, I will say, Putin, the historian, actually has more echoes in, Chi in China. Uh, Putin, as a politician whose behavior, who's, well, the joke is that a middle-aged woman's dream husband. It's in, uh, where is that? It's Chinese. So, um, Chinese woman's dream husband, as I say, Middle Asian. So Putin, I'm like, can you believe that? Uh, I don't believe that, but I, <laughs> according to Paul, that's the case. So it is quite something. A lot of things go goes on. N uh, I don't think Chinese take Russian lightly. That's the point. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, I think we're going to bring our discussion to <coughs> a close. Uh, a great thanks to Professor Xiang. Uh, proving uh, better late than never. Thank you so much for coming and adding your comments. A big thanks to Maria for single-handedly leading the conversation for a, a good part of the conversation. And many thanks to you for your patience and uh, for your questions. So thanks so much for coming. And <laughs> we you. look forward to uh, seeing you again at uh, our oncoming, ongoing series uh, with the Kennan Institute and the Kissinger Institute. So thanks so much. Thanks a lot.